Globus. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Great. So this is a really important topic. Um, I think all of you are in this room because you agree with the title of my session called Breaking the Compromise, how the best managers can achieve their SDGs and deliver the bottom line, yes? Do any of you think not? because we'll talk about when it doesn't happen either as well. So let me reintroduce the panel. We have a venture capitalist from Israel, a CEO from Japan, a American with also many other nationalities behind him, uh, uh, investor uh, sitting next to me. And I wanted to first just kick off with this statement around um, how these compromises are broken at the best companies. Meanwhile, I don't know how many of you have seen the business roundtable statement signed by 181 CEOs in the US the other day. Okay. There's a new statement of purpose uh, by the leading American corporate CEO organization called the Business Roundtable. It was issued just last month, and it was quite controversial. Let me read it to you and see if you think it is controversial. The new statement of purpose of a corporation that was signed by 181 CEOs in the United States. They commit to lead their companies for the benefit of all stakeholders, customers, employees, suppliers, communities, and shareholders. And this was and continues to be actually quite controversial in the US because on the one hand, people say, what? It's not just about the shareholders? And the other guys are saying, well, of course, it's never been just by the shareholders. Um, Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum said, I was the founder of the stakeholder concept in 1971. Uh, there's another CEO that says, yeah, every CEO focuses extensively on the needs of society until they have a bad quarter. So let me start with that, and maybe I go from uh, right, uh, your left to right to just get an opening comment about what you believe in terms of the theme of the session and your initial reactions. Sure. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, it's really an honor to be uh, back in Japan. Um, Actually, I was here last year, and uh, at that time, it was all about blockchain and AI, yeah. and I was uh, in a panel as well. And the fact that uh, you know the the title is uh, is the impact investing, SDGs, sustainability, etc., shows that this is the new blockchain, mm -hmm. in a way. So it's, uh, and I think um, that's. On one hand, it's amazing, it's positive, and, and, I, and I think we should celebrate that. On the other hand, I think uh, there are a lot of challenges, and I don't want to go into it now, but I think uh, we are here to, uh, to challenge you and the, and the thoughts that uh, Nikita just uh, read about. Great, thank you. CG? Yes. Uh, Some quick overview thoughts. Uh, about the business roundtable, yes. yes. I think it's the right timing, or a good timing, uh, to introduce these concepts. Um, especially in Japan. Um, I work for uh, a life insurance company. Uh, a very the, big one. Well, <laughs> uh, we are always categorized as the incumbents. <laughs> but I, I'm a little bit a, a different animal uh, in my company because I um, studied at uh, Harvard uh, Business School and my kind of mindset has been set in my younger days uh, to you know, minimize the agency cost. And uh, the shareholders has the, the first priority uh, at that time, from 90 to 1992. Um, so, um, and um, I think I, I want to touch on what uh, Kono Taro-san said in the morning. Uh, he said, uh, after the Cold War, um, yeah, well, during the Cold War, we, we had the, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, easier to imagine what we have to compete uh, against the Eastern world. So, so growth was kind of prioritized to anything. So in that sense, um, many countries, including Japan, exploited our natural resources, um, so societal welfare, maybe, uh, to achieve high growth. But now there's after the Cold War, there's no certain uh, uh, opponent that we have to compete. 
um, Japan now uh, are, we have the affluent nation now, um, matured. So our, va our social values, I think, have shifted uh, nowadays. Uh, and I think the current uh, multi-stakeholder uh, approach fits uh, the current uh, value, social value. So I think it's, for Japan, uh, the best timing to, to address uh, the challenges, of course, and, and the values that we have to uh, see. So as a CEO uh, with a company uh, has been successful for over 100 years, I have to renew our OS or operating system, uh, how we prioritize business. Uh, so I think that as a CEO, that will be my challenge in this new era. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to here. you and ask you uh, how what the easy parts are and what the hard parts are in terms of actually now living those values. But maybe, Thierry, some opening comments? Yeah, so I think that this uh, statement is both uh, important uh, and uh, necessary. Uh, important because I anyone who has run a company, large or small, in the public market uh, as a listed company or as a private company knows that if you don't pay attention to all the st stakeholders, you will not have a successful company. Uh, so to many, this may be self-evident. Um, I think it's important to bring it to the fore and make it very explicit. And I think that's one of the purposes that the, the leadership of the Business Roundtable uh, has uh, decided to make this statement at this time. And I, I completely agree, this is the right time and the appropriate time to be doing so. But the second aspect, necessary. So I think we do have to step back and be aware that in many places, capitalism is under siege. Uh, you know, young people in America, there are surveys that indicate that, you know, more than half of young Americans don't believe in capitalism. Maybe they don't understand the definition of, in ca of capitalism. Uh, certainly none of them have experienced socialism, certainly not of the type that was, for example, uh, uh, executed in the Soviet Union, now the former Soviet Union. That's the reason it's the former Soviet Union. But um, I think that that's, that is a significant issue. Uh, and uh, yet another reason why it's, uh, it's essential that this discussion be put uh, on the fore. The other aspect that's embedded in this statement, which I think is also important, uh, and, and I reflect on this as somebody who invests in companies uh, in private equity or sitting on uh, investment committees of charitable institutions, um, and, uh, but also somebody who's worked as a CEO, and that is that uh, implicit in it, and, and I think there are some detailed statements about this, is a focus on the long term. So if you're going to uh, succeed in the long term, you have to pay attention to your customers, to your employees, to your suppliers. And you also have to be concerned about the communities in which you operate for the long term. The challenge has been uh, in facing uh, the investment world, we, we can ask, uh, I thankfully no longer uh, represent any public company uh, as a board member, so I don't have to face this. But you, uh, Inagaki-san, have to face investors who are asking you, so what will the result be next quarter? You know, this tyranny of the short term uh, is a big challenge for executives. And the Business Roundtable statement, I think, very appropriately puts more focus on the long term and the need for long term success. Uh, for all of society. Great. I think particularly coming from the U.S. perspective as well, I think the long-term piece I think is uh, quite important. But let me bring it back to Dennis um, and each of the gentlemen in terms of how they live and breathe these values in terms of their investment decisions, the way they run their companies, or Thierry, the way you look at the portfolio of businesses you run uh, with an eye towards, you know, how do you specifically incorporate ESGs, SDGs, whatever you call them. And by the way, I was going to ask, for those of you in the audience do you for, that work for a corporation, is it clear in your mind what the priority ESGs, SDGs are? If I read your annual reports, would it be clear? Because there's like 17 of them. Very few companies do all 17. Is it pretty clear? A little fuzzy? OK. OK. So that's the audience. Is it clear to you, Dennis? Um, so, uh, I'm wearing here many hats, uh, so let's, um, before, uh, I'm representing, you know, venture capital and investing in innovation. Um, before I maybe go into that uh, deeper, maybe just, again, 
just to challenge the idea of SDGs. So obviously, the SDGs are, again, an amazing framework. And we had to wait hundreds of years uh, until they uh, came about. But I think, and, and I'm, I'm going to risk this, I'm, I'm going to ask the audience, and maybe I should ask in, in, invertedly. So like, how many think that it is the, the SDGs are, are rigorous enough and, 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 and good and strong enough? If if you just so can I assume that no, this I assume that everybody thinks that it's not good because that's what I want to hear yeah so I, that's why I asked this way um, so I think they that's are that's why they're at this session to learn the mysteries <laughs> of SDGs <laughs> no so 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 because I think we may be in disagreement and that's good in a panel if people disagree um, they are I think so broad that big basically it covers everything and that helps that becomes basically. I mean, and, and again, there's a lot, amazing, a lot of good, good sides. I want to make sure that I'm politically correct, that, but but I think people can misuse it, and, and and companies misusing it tremendously, because now they can use it as a marketing tool. There is, I think, anything you do is going to be in one of those 17, yeah. And you can smell like, you can dress like, you can feel like it is, but actually you don't. You you don't do it. So, so that is the, the, the biggest issue is how you measure it. I mean, we can just we can spend probably a whole session or, or actually a whole day on arguing and discussing what is the definition of SDG. How and and and, and should it be a how it should be a homogeneous, acceptable measurement system? And what are the KPIs? And I think and I think in, in venture capital, it's actually much easier because we can decide when we when we interview the founder when we look at the company we can see the intentionality of the founder and that is something very very different we can decide if we invest in this company or not so it can really be we can really become an impact investor if you want to be and that's something that you know big companies cannot decide they are usually not in SDG, and now because they have this framework, these regulations, they have to comply, and they they don't want to be the bad guys. So they put the, again many many of them doing an amazing job, but they they put in the, uh, a couple of keywords. So when people are doing AI robotics on their annual reports, they all come up. Uh, they all come up uh, that we're doing poverty and you know hunger and uh, and 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 you know life underwater etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's it and I'm and I'm done checkbox and and that is the big issue and and um, maybe later on I can we can talk about how venture capital I think is really driving as actually as the genes in both direct and indirect way. But yes, so we'll come back to that. I think there's some very interesting perspectives. I know you often get us asked, how is Israel so far ahead in terms of this thinking around impact investing? But maybe, Seiji, I can bring it back to you in terms of how you're trying to embed mm -hmm. some of these um, maybe fuzzy metrics mm -hmm. or big concepts in terms of the way you run your business. And I'm sure it's all very easy and everyone agrees. Yep. Um, <laughs> um, I'm taking SDGs very seriously. Um, I, I will to use SDGs concept to transform our corporate values. Um, but uh, I cannot say that it, the, the whole concept has permeated my, my organization thoroughly, to be honest. And so I, I'd like to take this advantage to, to what, what I'm thinking as a CEO to, to lead uh, my company uh, for the next five to ten years. Um, insurance industry, like any industry in Japan, uh, it, it's red ocean. So we have to change our concept, especially in life insurance. Uh, the population is now shrinking in Japan. <coughs> um, interest rates, uh, very difficult to invest. 90% uh, of the household holds, holds some kind of protection uh, within their ho uh, ho uh, household. So just selling life insurance is, is a very difficult uh, and becoming tougher and tougher. Uh, so maybe a typical Red Oceans uh, scenario if, if our industry uh, is analyzed by a BCG analysts. <laughs> so we have to compete on premiums, price, uh, product features, and we have to compete on commissions that we pay to the agents. So 
as a consequence, uh, even though we optimize our existing operations every year, uh, but we are faced with diminishing returns, a typical red ocean scenario. So, so at my company, Daiichi, I'm trying to redefine our values from our uh, life insurance seller to our quality of life provider. Mm, it sounds very nice, but it's very <laughs> difficult to implement. <laughs> so, you know, um, so we are now starting to focus the social challenges of Japan and, and the regional prefecture that we also operate in. And now people in Japan, now, a 100-year lifespan is now a big challenge. Uh, and the health uh, span, uh, so health span uh, is uh, average age of people with no severe illness is what we, what we call a health span. Uh, and the gap between health span and your lifespan is not decreasing. It is actually uh, widening gradually. So uh, that is our challenge, uh, social challenge in Japan. Uh, so uh, we are, we'd like to address that issue uh, and improve the quality of life by using uh, big data analysis, new, new techniques, new uh, initiatives and uh, to be a lifetime partner of our insurance. Just so it is very difficult to, to change the mindset of the 60,000 employees that Daiichi hires. But, you know, I think this challenge is uh, really to change the, the values and what we prioritize, uh, uh, what we had prioritized uh, when the market was growing. So I think. That is a challenge that Japan has to address. And SDGs, I think, works as a very good tool and to reorganize our thoughts. Right. Since you mentioned BCG analysts, um, let me share some data with the audience. We had actually um, studied a couple hundred companies around the world in four sectors, consumer, retail, financial services, oil and gas, and pharma, to look at the difference between uh, TSR, total shareholder return, and a metric we call total shareholder impact, a total societal impact, excuse me, TSI, as a proxy for all those SDGs or ESGs or good things companies are doing by doing a text analysis of the annual reports on how often they talk about this stuff and how often they measure the before and after. So you can argue it's correlation and not causality, but there is a material valuation premium that we saw in companies that were able to deliver the bottom line but also deliver on the TSI metrics. So we do have some quantitative dem demonstration. It was very big in oil and gas, which kind of makes sense. It's an industry that is fraught with things that might go badly if they do bad things to the environment. Uh, but even in consumer goods and biopharma, you know, 10, 12 point different in valuation. So with that, uh, Terry, I know we had an interesting debate over lunch too about is it fuzzy enough is it, or is it too fuzzy? How do we make it specific? How do you incorporate it in your business? So um, I'm going to try to cover three aspects of my own experience okay. with this. So Sorry. first, short. First is uh, at Shinsei Bank. Uh, as CEO, I decided to adopt the uh, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, 2006, 2007. I did that. So why was I doing that? I was doing that because I was going through a branding exercise for the company, trying to differentiate ourselves from large behemoth uh, banks. We are we're a small bank, trying to find our path. And also because in doing that exercise, what we felt was important is that it had to become something that was real for all the employees. And so from my perspective, SDG was a way to create that differentiation. There were very few co Japanese companies at that time. I was in the first group. I think you were in the leading uh, edge, leading I edge. Went to, yeah. I went to Geneva for the yeah. conference that they held for companies to promote this. Now, I'll just give you one aspect, though. Younger employees, those employees who came from the outside, they were, they, they were on board. Yes, the SDGs are fuzzy, uh, but they felt that this was aspirational, and it reflected what the company was seeking to achieve. My legacy employees, and there may be a few in this room who are legacy long-term credit bank people, said, what does this have to do with us? Reducing poverty? We don't have poor people in Japan. Why are we doing this? That's literally what they told me. And also that's what they wrote on channel two. So uh, that was one experience. 
In my private equity work, and I'll go to ESG. So in my private equity work, you know, if you're doing private equity, you're investing for five, seven, even 10 years. You have to take a long-term perspective. That naturally, therefore, puts you into the ESG framework, in my opinion. What I would share with all of you uh, in terms of the approach to that is I always start with the G. Because it has to be with the governance, and it has to start at the top. So we come in as an investor. We recruit new executives to run the company, and we say, this is what we care about. We care about good governance. We care about diversity in that governance. We care about a set of principles that you must embody. We care about tone at the top. And then things run through there. Now, we're also, uh, in my primary uh, private equity investing, are involved in financial services. So that often involves dealing with consumers. And so it is extremely important to be very clear about what your principles are in terms of the, the loans that you give, uh, how you go about collecting loans. I mean, that's where the S uh, and the E start to come in, in terms of how you're dealing with your customers and your local community. As an uh, investor, uh, chair of, of committees uh, that invest uh, long term, very long term, so I'm, I'm on several committees that are related to the Society of Jesus of the Catholic Church, the investment horizon is very long. So why do we care about ESG? We care about ESG because when we look at some of the analysis that's been provided, those companies that have high aspirational uh, objectives and make them explicit do a better job. That doesn't ensure, I would tell you, that does not ensure that every investment will be successful. Markets fluctuate, companies make strategic decisions, some are good when they're advised by BCG, others are not, you know. So uh, that can vary, but in the main, when you look directionally, it makes a big difference, and that's why uh, we look at it in that way. No, thank you, Terry. I think those are three great stories. But, um, Dennis, let me bring it back to you, because this whole notion around, I guess, one or two generations ago, these issues were held, held, um, managed by the CSR departments, and a lot of Japanese corporates still have CSR departments. They're now being renamed SDG departments and so on. But I know you often get asked, as an Israeli, um, uh, investor, you know, how are you so far ahead and what can we in Japan do to catch up? Our data would suggest that we are indeed behind other OECD nations in this uh, vernacular and really incorporated in, into our day-to-day -day business lives. Um, and the uh, asset managers, too, are starting to incorporate it into their de investment decisions, but we are behind versus some other countries. So perhaps you can give us the advice you give other people on <laughs> either how Japan catches up, or why is Israel so far ahead, and what are those elements we can learn from? Well, how much time do I have? Um, uh, <laughs> so, it's inter interesting that you're saying uh, CSR. Most people, you know, it, CSR stands for Corporate uh, Social Responsible, it's called. Uh, and, um, and a couple of years ago, when, I mean, I. The reason I come quite a lot to Japan because I have a lot of LPs, investors here who are already now investing in Israel through us, and we help. And it's mainly a lot of Japanese LPs, typical family offices, but also mainly corporates. And the, the corporates are really I I become I actually I become like a BCG consultant in a way because it's it's all about educating. Yeah, <laughs> I become I like I really have to educate them. You know, I mean, we, we have a lot, and, and we are very, we have to be humble. I mean, we have a lot to learn from Japan. I mean, Japan is really a, been a miracle, and, and we never been able to, uh, no, in Israel, be creating a Hitachi or Toyota or any, any companies close, close to that. But, but w whenever I meet these corporates, all they want to learn about is, you know, innovation and, and, and what is, what, what's, what's the secret sauce in our hummus uh, in our, in a, and in our, in an our uh, uh, startup nation? What makes it uh, so special? And it's, and it's, and I'm going to get back to the CSR so, so that, so that, you know, what we have seen, there is, there is a transformation. So I can see it in the, in the, in the, in the last couple of years coming here. First of all, more and more Japanese corporates setting up CVCs. I think they are 10, 15 years late, if I may challenge you. Um, but it, it's happening. Also, the type of people that run CVCs are usually coming from internal, which really 
don't really often, they, they know the technology, they know the company inside out, but they don't, they, they lack the knowledge of venture capital because it's called venture capital for a reason. It's not real estate, it's not buying, it's not M&A. Venture capital is probably one of the hardest animals uh, which is, you know, because it's very difficult to value a company. What, what is the valuation of a company? You know, uh, there are no spreadsheets. They don't have excels and profit and loss, etc. So when usually what happens, and maybe I'll guide you through this, is first the CEO realizes this, and through the board, putting pressure on him, etc., and they create somebody called the CIO. The CIO used to stand for chief information officer. Now they become the chief innovation officer, but I think there's a big mistake. Who is the CIO? Who, who should be the CIO in the company? The CEO. If the CEO is not the CIO, I'm, I would short your, your shares. I'm sorry. I, mean, I, don't mean, I don't mean. I don't know. I don't mean. I don't. Mean, he's a CIO. He's a CIO. He's a, no. I, I. I meant very clearly. Say to get ready. You're the next question. <laughs> so. So the point is that it. It. It has to come all the way from the top. You can't outsource I innovation to a CIO. And the same thing, I think, very similarly to the social. That's my point is when you say CSR, we have a chief social executive, whatever, CSE, whatever. If it is not the CEO, it's not going to happen. So that's one point. And, and um, I don't want to take your time, so maybe I, 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 I'm happy to speak about Israel, but maybe the next round or, or whatever, you're, you're the boss. <laughs> <laughs> so, so whenever I meet these corporates, uh, uh, whether they are CIOs or CEOs, um, they always ask. So tell me, what, what, what can we learn from you? What can we, uh, what can we bring into? And, and whenever, whenever I'm in Japan and in a panel, they ask me, okay, tell us what, what, what's the secret sauce of, 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 of the, the startup nation? And, and of course, there's a lot of answers. But I think what we can, what we can all learn from Israel is, is that there is an ecosystem with many different stakeholders in it. And it's number one, it's the corporate, uh, it's the government, the government, the government's responsibility to create a uh, different kind of venture capital type of, of funds which are non-refundable, which are really have a very, very good, very good terms. That's one. Second is the corporates. The corporates have huge responsibility because they are the ones where the startups will, you know, the innovative companies will have to do POCs and they have to try their product work. The third is the universities with the, the tech transfers and the universities will have to give, you know, a platform where it is cool to be innovative and then in, 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 uh, work with innovation, innovative technologies and, and they have all the resources. The fourth is the venture capital, and again, as we discussed, venture capital is not anything to do with real estate, or it's, it's not capital, it's venture capital. And the fifth, which is the most difficult, is the mentality, which is our risk, which is relationship to risk, which is our relationship to failure. By definition, the, the, the definition of an entrepreneur is I'm fail, I fail, I fail, I fail until I get it right. What happens in Japan after the first failure? Yeah. Goodbye. Oh. Okay. So you have time. It's for me. <laughs> but you got it. So 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 how can you? Co it's it's a it's a joint effort. It's a joint effort of these five five uh, areas, but I, I think has to be all come together with, in this ecosystem, and that will fuel the innovations. Again, government, the corporates, the universities. The venture, the professional venture capitalists who know what they're doing, and then the soft, the soft part, the whole about the, the relationship to failure. Right. We often talk about because it's a majority Japanese crowd. I think at this uh, this particular session about how Japan is um, uh, slightly behind, and even on venture capital, I think we were both in a panel this morning, heard from one of the panelists how small that funding is. So we bring it back to Japan, and Thierry, you've lived, I think, in Japan as long, or even longer than I have, and Seiji, maybe you can talk about what will it require for either Japan to catch up? Do we need all five elements? I, for one, have a lot of faith in the corporates. Forgive me for the government people here and the academics, but I just think that some extraordinary things can happen with one leader at the top 
and then the next layer and so on. So I don't know if you both would like to share some perspectives of what will it take for Japan um, mm -hmm. to fully embrace some of these things mm -hmm. uh, and catch up with the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, so I think most all of the uh, Japanese corporates have a CSR department or some functions. But recently, we see you know, a, a press conference that the CEO is apologizing about the misbehavior of, of their, <laughs> especially currently in some of my industry, the financial industry. So, you know, we kind of uh, embrace the, the concept of SDG, SDGs, but, but, the, but the operation is not in, not in place yet. So uh, that is the challenge that I am facing uh, internally. So uh, there's a, a huge kind of inertia, if I may say so, and, and in Japanese companies, to the, the, the big growth that, that and the success they achieved uh, during the post-war, uh, where the market was growing. And all the, the incentives and business models are kind of factored in and optimized, and it's very difficult to unlearn uh, the success. So, if, you, if one employee, well, it's not the case for my company, but if uh, uh, an employee uh, makes a failure, he, he won't get fired, but, uh, you know, uh, so it's very difficult to, 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 to you know, uh, speak up and disrupt your, your, your companies or disrupt your business model. Uh, I think the concept of SDGs and I think ESG as, uh, as well is to, you know, Put in a, a, a you know re reorganize our agenda or prioritization uh, in in the current state of Japan. Um, so it's not for insurance industry; it's for all Japanese corporates to face that. So you know those kind of venture capitals uh, motivation it hasn't been properly rewarded in, in this uh, social system in Japan. So that is my challenge. Terry, and again, I don't mean to suggest that everyone else is perfect and Japan's the only imperfect. I know no, no, but we talked about some of the imperfections in the BRT. Right, but I, I'd like to talk about, about, you know, there, there's actually some very good news here in this entire movement or ESG and, and the business roundtable. And that is when you think about Japan and you think about concern about all the stakeholders, actually Japan does quite well. Uh, and if you don't want to believe that, here's what I tell my foreign friends who come to, who talk about Japan and say, you know, it's over, you know, the society is aging, there's no growth, it can't get out of deflation. And, I, and then they come to Japan and they see, they see Tokyo, all right? And I say, so, remember you were talking about those two lost decades? And this is what we have in Japan. Now, let's think about two lost decades in New York City. And I think we're talking about you have to carry a gun to protect yourself, all right? Now, how did that happen? Uh, many different things happened, but I think that the concern that companies have had, by the way, a criticism that foreign investors have had of Japanese companies for decades, you know, they, uh, lifetime employment, you know, and they care too much about the customers, and boy, this, this quality stuff, it's out of control. How can you make a profit, right? These are the complaints. These are strengths. These are strengths. Japan actually leads in stakeholder capitalism. And actually, Japan is one country where I don't hear people complaining about capitalism. Right? Is there anybody out there comparing, complaining about capitalism in Japan? No, they're not. This is a strength. And so my, what I encourage my, uh, my old and new Japanese corporate leaders, friends, is, you know, be bold. Be bold, you have a lot going for you. The second thing I would say is on CSR. As some of you in the room who know me, I have gone and raised a lot of money in this town, or tried to. So I go to a lot of CSR uh, departments, and it's like, and here's what CSR stands. You know, it stands for cannot see relevance. That's what it stands for me, all right? Because who are these people? They're not empowered, they're doing box ticking, uh, and you know, I think the point is being made. Inagaki-san, your comments are making it very clear. You see this that comes from the top. You're saying, you know, uh, I think shorting is a little bit severe. Maybe just <laughs> sell, just sell the shares. But you know, if the CEO is not focused on these issues, it's a bad sign. 
So I think that this needs to be, so my point is, in, in, in quick summary, is we have a lot more going for us in terms of the model in Japan uh, that is toward ESG and, you know, stakeholder capitalism that works, including for the company and including for its shareholders. And by the way, on some of the things that we need to do, which I would say from a pure corporate finance point of view, remember I worked at Morgan Stanley years ago, we're finally catching up here in Japan. That's good news. So, and then at the same time, I think CSR needs to be taken as a banner that is actually managed and developed from the top of the companies. Agreed. I think one thing that does give me faith is the youth of Japan. Um, the youth of Japan, along with uh, other major economies in the world, a, a little bit of data again. When you ask young people where do they want to work, if they want to work in a business environment, um, it's very clear that this stuff matters. So corporate purpose, corporate mission, what the company stands for. Uh, yes, making money is important too, but, for, oh, but we've done this study over the years and we see that pay is number five or six, and purpose, linked to some of these values, ranks number one or two which is, I think, another reason why CEOs and uh, good companies will have to take this seriously because there is a worldwide talent shortage, not only in Japan, but even in China in the next few years. I think India will be about the only economy in the world that will have excess labor. Every country in Europe will start running out of labor as well. So with that, I think um, maybe you guys can comment and see if you see that too in terms of the people that you're attracting to work for you, with you, in your companies that you're investing, or Seiji in your company, in, in terms of your value proposition to the next generation of talent? Um, yes, so this is still my challenge. Uh, I cannot say that I have achieved that yet, but I think I, I want to make a, a, a virtuous cycle to if my, my company's uh, value creation model uh, can be resonated by the young people and attracted, uh, attract young people to come to work at my company and they can push further uh, on the value creation model, uh, it will be a virtuous cycle. And I think I <clears throat> completely agree with Thierry that uh, we have a lot of uh, blue ocean that we haven't really uh, digged in into. And uh, so I'm bullish. Uh, most of the CEOs are bullish, but I'm extremely bullish in Japan. Uh, a lot of value can be created, and we can, you know, get out of the price war and uh, provide and deliver value to our society. Uh, and you know, it's not. I'm not saying this because I'm uh, sitting in front of a huge audience. Uh, I really believe that. And Japan can, you know, if they can rewrite their operating system. Uh, or the mindset, I think, you know, there, there's a lot of optimism going forward in Japan. Thank you. All right, why don't we open up for questions? If you can state your name, a question, not a statement. The, whoever gets the mic first, <laughs> please. Yes, thanks very much for the uh, interesting discussion. I'm Meg Tsuda. My question is, you know, uh, for, for example, we are not good at being showy. Mm. You know, our CEO, I, I believe that he won't do something good, but he won't to do it secretly. <laughs> How can I change my CEO's mindset to okay. being more showy? <laughs> That's my question. Thank you. Okay. Any, any uh, advice for marketing strategies for Japanese conservative CEOs? Um, well, <laughs> it is, well, this is, it, mm, let, let, it is much more, uh, well, the, the toughest job for, 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 for me is to, you know, we have those quarterly earnings reports, annual, you know, shareholder meetings and have to meet, uh, there's some quite uh, funds uh, that invest in, invest in my company. Uh, and their their agenda is a little bit different uh, from 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 my agenda. Uh, but you know, so f uh, speaking to our employees or, uh, uh, about the top line growth is is the toughest thing that I have to do as a CEO. Um, so speaking about you know uh, concepts and uh, value, social value creation, is is the easier part and the fun part of be being a CEO. So. 
you know, you, you should uh, push more. <laughs> and, uh, I think there's, you know, a very uh, a lot of occasion that your CEO uh, gives presentation to employees mm -hmm. and your shareholders. I think you know it, it will be a, a much more uh, exciting and uh, uh, motivating message uh, than other you know uh, very tiny parts of the business operation. So I encourage you. <laughs> to, no, he, he's to push an authentic forward. and lovely gentleman, but uh, I so uh, you know I, I have to say from hard experience of working in this country, so being showy is a problem, uh, largely because uh, that means that you can be criticized particularly by the media, who enjoys criticizing corporate ex executives. Uh, so I think that's just a reality. You probably know that well. How can you overcome it? I think there are a couple of strategies that I can suggest to you. One, you know, talking about these things should be about we, not about I. So instead of your CEO doing it all by himself, you know, here's the crazy thing. You know, something goes wrong in a company. I did this, I think, six times in my tenure. Something goes wrong in the company. I have to go and bow and, you know, apologize by myself. But then something goes right, you know. Uh, I think I should do that with a group of people, right? So if you do it, if you turn it from I to we, I think that you can blunt this issue that he's being too showy. That's number one. Number two, what you can do in your work uh, is uh, have those conversations with those who are opinion makers, including investors, uh, that demonstrates that they really do care about this. So that when they hear about it in the public from your CEO, they're actually pleased about that and might even send him some positive feedback. It matters. It makes a difference. I think there is a feeling that on the, you know, being a CEO is an isolated position and an isolating position in many ways. You don't get many opportunities to get feedback. Uh, but if you can get some feedback before, after, then it can make a difference. The third thing is your CEO should spend more time with foreign companies <laughs> and foreign company leaders who are not so shy, who are much, so sh more, much more showy. He won't, be, he won't seem to be so showy when standing next to CEOs, particularly, I have to say, from American companies, all right? And he might even learn a few techniques that could help him. I mean, I say that in a little bit in jest, but I think that, uh, you know, there's safety in numbers. You know, if you're the only one doing something, uh, that, that can be a little bit scary. But if you're doing it in a group of others, so finding others who are like-minded in pursuing some of these things, and talking about them. I, I think that's, a, that's another way to get at that problem. That's a great media training snippet right there. Um, let me get two questions in from the two ladies. Uh, if you can just ask your questions, we'll see uh, whom on the panel can answer. Uh, my name is Kawula Yapkent. I come from uh, Tajan. Um, my question um, to whoever would like to answer is um, how can I overcome uh, the the pressure from from the shareholder to deliver um, short term bottom line success and to overcome uh, the risk versus opportunity um, um, dilemma that I that we see in our companies because intellectually my leadership team has no problems to take more risk or see more opportunities. But when uh, they have done the next meeting with our uh, shareholders, um, they um, unfortunately are not on the same page. Right. So how can we overcome right. this? So where does this issue lie when you have a bad quarter? Yeah. OK, good question. One more question. I think you had a question. Yes, thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Amanda Leland with Environmental Defense Fund. And my question is, um, to what extent are Japanese companies incorporating climate change into your business models at this point? Great questions. Can anybody volunteer to answer either one? Yeah. Uh, so on, on your problem, my sympathies. <laughs> Uh, there, there is no easy answer. I think well, here's, here's, here's one of the challenges in what the Business Roundtable ha has done, and that is that you know, there's a presumption that everything that you do is win-win. You know, and so there'll never be a down quarter. Um, and of course, we know that that's not true. Um, so uh, I think that how do you get through that? 
I think that uh, one way to get through that is you need to be very clear in articulating uh, you know, what are the principles that are most important. What are the things that are non-negotiable in your strategy, in particular as it relates to ESG issues, uh, and how you measure them. So I think one of the responses that you can have is that, again, you, you are not going to be able to ensure that every, uh, every quarter is going to be an up quarter. Uh, and I think that you know, any smart investor is going to know that. Um, but if any smart investor that can see you know, this is the overarching strategy, this is what is non-negotiable in terms of how we pursue that strategy, these are the principles by which we operate, and this is how we measure what we're doing. And this is the big challenge. So I say this as an investor in public companies through investment committees, you know, investing for a long-term horizon. So how do we get at that? It's hard. I think some of it can be measured quantitatively, but not everything. So I think that companies have to be more bold in providing qualitatively you know, what it is that uh, they're seeking to achieve, and then give themselves their own report card. I think that's, you know, uh, putting yourself out front is, I think, the, uh, the best antidote to that problem. I mean, I think, <coughs> I think this is the most important question. <laughs> one, well, probably one of the most important questions that we have to, we have to try to find answers to. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll connect it with what was your, Mickey's uh, uh, last question about talent. I think it has to be, you have to, it's, it's a long-term goal. And maybe short-term, it will hurt your profits. But if you want to stay alive and you have a long-term goal, uh, I don't think there is a, there is a way uh, around it. And if you think about it, um, if I really simplify, simplify it, there are three main drivers in whatever, whether we are in venture capital or, or in private equity or even if, if you're a public company. So there are three main drivers. One is the consumers. At the end of the day, if, you're not, if your consumers are not happy, you can close the business. That's one. Two is the talent inside the company. Yeah, if you don't have good talent, you're not going to be, you're not going to win the war. You, you know, you're going to lose to the competitors. And third is your investors, whether you're in venture capital, and I have LPs, whether you're public. So let's look at those three main drivers, because they're going to define your success in the next, in, in the future. There are obviously other government policies, etc. But those are the three main drivers, and and consumers are becoming much more SDG conscious. They driven by purpose, and they and they going to put pressure. They're going to put pressure on every single company. That's one. Two, we discussed it. We discussed it. Mickey and 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 most of you and Terry and also Sigi, you spoke about it talent looking for purpose and meaning as well. They, they don't want to work, the best talent, the best talent, those who can choose, they just don't want to work with any company. They want to work with a company that has meaning and purpose. So you want to attract good talent? It's your decision. And third is the investors. The investors are becoming also much more purpose-oriented, which is extremely interesting. We've seen this, and, and especially in Asia, where we see that I think uh, Hong Kong took over New York with the most uh, number of ultra high net worth individuals. I don't know, maybe that was six months ago today, maybe they are not anymore. But, uh, <laughs> so, but, but I mean, Asia is, the wealth is growing so incredibly. And, 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 and these are, they are so conscious that they want, and you know, it used to be that SDG or whatever, it was run by philanthropists. You know, it's philanthropists, but philanthropists realize that they hate or, or no, sorry, they don't like nonprofits. And what, on the other hand, we see that investors are looking to invest, not just for, they're looking for the triple bottom line, the three Ps, which is people, planet, and profit. Yeah, so, so those, you can't avoid, and I think this is the most important question which you ask. Like, this is very much, I think, you know, the, the, the title of this station uh, is, is like, those three things will change your business if you don't if you don't uh, keep updated with it. Great. Dennis, um, back to on um, the planet piece and Amanda's question around climate. 
Um, I don't know if any of you gentlemen have data about Japanese corporates incorporating that. What I do know is that from a Japanese consumer perspective, when you talk to Japanese consumers versus, say, Americans or Germans or whatnot, Japanese say they want to be green and they care, but they don't want to pay the premium. So we still have that you know, lag between the mind wants it, but the wallet can't afford that premiumness from eco-sustainable, climate-friendly stuff. That's one piece of data. And the other piece is we are, in Japan, ahead on things like recycling. We have recycling rates up to the whatever versus all of the markets. But on climate, in terms of what I've looked at uh, when the B20, G20 happened in Osaka, just a quick scan, the whole sort of carbon neutrality, carbon footprint stuff is not part of the natural lexicon, which is probably why organizations like yours are, have a lot of work to do. But any other reactions? Uh, Seiji, please, yes. on the climate question. Uh, yeah, for, for climate questions. Um, I think Japanese corporates are um, very serious uh, in uh, achieving uh, sustainability in the environment. Um, they're, they're, but they're not good at presenting. Uh, too, shy. too shy, maybe, <laughs> the earlier question. Um, so they have the technologies and they have been achieving uh, a, a substantial uh, achievements uh, in carbon em emissions. Uh, so I think, you know, we're not good at presentation. And I think the customer, I think you, Dennis, you have touched on, the customers are much more keen. And uh, so the industry like mine, um, you know, I think that our future policyholders will be interested in how we invest our policyholders' money, and we have those is, uh, doing those in ESG integration and in where we invest. So I think attracting those initiatives are attracting a lot of attention now. So I, I'm also optimistic in that area. Yeah, I would agree. I think I think that uh, I think that it is on the agenda of Japanese companies. I think it is it is not well presented. I think it's unevenly distributed uh, and unevenly applied. So, for example, uh, you know, Japan is the world leader in recycling, but ask people to pay three more yen. Oh no 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 no! I can't do that. So that we might use less plastic. Oh no 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 no! I can't do that. So th these are things that that are a little bit hard to understand and need to be adjusted. But there's one other issue, and that is that you know companies can do a lot, but the government has to do a lot. And unfortunately, in my personal opinion, this government with regard to fossil fuels you know, is just not telling the truth. I mean, we have, of course, the problem with nuclear power plants in this country. It's very emotional. It's an issue. But you know, there are 38 coal-fired plants on the boards to be built in this country. That's insane. That's nuts. And there are alternatives. And there are alternatives. And here, there needs to be much more of a dialogue between the public sector and the private sector as to you know, how to address this issue for the longer term. Thanks for that. Let's get two more questions. Yes. Can you get a mic here? Thank you. I'm Jackie Steele. I'm just the founder of uh, Enjoy Diversity and Inclusion Consulting and Training. It's a new firm here in Tokyo, and I'm trying to bring lessons from political science, public policy, mainstreaming diversity, women's empowerment, which we do really well in some countries around the world in public policy. But the challenge, I think, is to bring it to corporate policy. And my question to the panel is, we've talked about CSR. We've talked about SDGs and the ESGs. Um, one of the challenges that I'm hearing in the diversity and inclusion conversation in Japan is that often diversity and inclusion is pigeonholed within Jinji. Within, it's, an it's an HR problem to be managed within Jinji. Or it's a PR. It's a PR concern. And I guess in the same ways that S, you know, corporate social responsibility needs to, to use Thierry's uh, words, you know, the tone from the top. How do you feel that we can move the dial on the conversation so that diversity and innovation and inclusion are led from the top and are no longer just sort of positioned and pigeonholed in Jinji where they don't necessarily have buy-in that allows for the modeling to go really from the highest level throughout the company to change culture? I'll take the question. I can talk for about <laughs> five hours on this, but you don't want to hear from me. I'm just facilitating. 
So um, yes, so that is a, a typical uh, challenge that I get, uh, one of the typical questions. And well, um, I think gender diversity and whole diversity is a challenge for, for, for Japanese corporates. And um, the top understands the problem. And uh, um, I think mm, uh, it, in reality, it takes time. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but it is happening. Um, and uh, the, one of the reasons is that the labor mobility is very low. So um, there are uh, several uh, executive, female executive, executives in my executive committee, but uh, you know, th they have to, they had to you know, step up the corporate ladder. And uh, to be fair, uh, the, the, there's a limited uh, who can be, you know, uh, is credible. Uh, to become the executive. So th that is the truth. Um, we are aggressively searching for outside talent, but it is very difficult. And uh, I'll end it here, but hmm. and we, we understand that problem, and it's a challenge, and we embrace uh, diversity. Uh, I think I'll there's still. a consulting firm that can help you. <laughs> 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 to add, but, you know, you, you, you have to look at it in a historical perspective. If you think it's tough now, you should think about what it was like uh, 15, 20 years ago. You know, 20 years. <laughs> so I mean, but just to give you one vignette, you know, at at, uh, at Shinsei Bank, I promoted more women to the uh, category of manager than the in the entire in two years than in the entire previous history of the company. All right, but uh, you had still a large contingent of legacy employees who didn't want to understand it and couldn't do it. I don't think that there is any lack of resolve, determination, and interest on the part of senior management of Japanese companies on this issue. Uh, and, uh, I, and I think that, uh, you know, but the issue is that, you know, there has to be also a system change. I mean, frankly, if you want to be radical, the way to fix this problem is to eliminate Jinji. You know, you eliminate the personnel department. In many companies, they have far too much power. You, you know, but then how do you get payroll and, you know, all the rest of work? So uh, my point to you, though, is there's enormous progress. And I'll give you another example of enormous progress. And I say this even though now Hori San has left the room. You know, I went to the first G1. There were very few women in the audience. There were no women leading the panels. Today, there are many women in this audience, and every panel is, has women on the panel. Uh, and I don't think that, that that's being done by the personnel department or for PR purposes. I think what it reflects, what it reflects is fundamental change that's happening in Japanese business society. You're seeing it here. Because frankly, if that fundamental change were not happening, it wouldn't be happening here. So it is happening here, and that's good news. I give you hope. <laughs> We have one minute and a half, so maybe just closing comments from each of you on the topic. But let's end on a high note, guys. That's what Horisan wants. Sure. Um, Action, <laughs> positivity. So you can take this on a micro or a macro level in, a, in your company or as an SDG, but there is, in our Jewish traditions, we have a saying, and I, I'm sure you heard it in different uh, aspect, is um, that when a when a person is hungry, you can give him a fish, and and uh, he's okay today, but he will be hungry again tomorrow. Or you can teach him how to fish, and then he will never be hungry the rest of his life. So I think whatever issue is, whether it's an SDG issue or whether it's your company, what you have to think about is not to focus on the band-aids today, but uh, on long-term solutions. Thank you, Dennis. Seiji? Yeah. Um, so. I'm going to repeat what I have uh, said in the earlier, uh, earlier uh, comments. Uh, I think it's the, the re rewriting of our operating system. Japan has to unlearn and adapt and achieve the steep learning curve uh, under this uh, current social value. So I'm bullish, uh, so there's a lot of upside that we can achieve. So in uh, keeping with Hori-san's request, I, I would uh, leave you with, you know, let's try to go out and create a set of measurement tools 
quantitative and qualitative on these categories of, of ESG. Not with the objective of creating a box ticking exercise, but with the objective of basically trying as a movement to move people to a higher level uh, of activity and a higher level of performance. Thank you, gentlemen. I think we broke the compromise. Thank you. A round of applause, please.